thank you all for coming to, um, this is the, uh, I think, second or third of our series of, from the um, Holocaust and Genocide Center at here at Bristol Community College, soon to be called the Institute for the Study of Holocaust and Genocide. We just changed our name. Uh, so um, really appreciate you coming. We are very fortunate to have uh, Dr. Jody Manning here as our speaker. And uh, just very briefly introduce him. He is uh, the Associate Director of the Ho Holocaust Genocide Center at Rowan University, which happens to be my alma mater, so I'm very proud of that. Yeah. You know? And um, it was Glassboro State College, now Rowan, that's a long story. <laughs> and anyway, uh, he's, associate, he's also Professor of History at Rowan, teaches a modern European history and Holocaust, right? Mm -hmm. and, and genocide. And genocide, yeah. right. And uh, he um, has a doctorate from Clark University, uh, one of the leading schools that really give, I think one of the few schools to give doctorates in that area. Yes, it has changed now, but the first. The first. The first. Right, mm -hmm. at Clark, which is, you know, down the, down the uh, highway. Anyway. Thank you. Um, yeah. uh, you just reminded me about Worcester, Massachusetts, where I spent a lot of time, actually. So um, thank you, and uh, thank you so much for this opportunity to speak about my time uh, at the Auschwitz-Birkenau State Museum. I'm gonna be talking about living in the shadows of Auschwitz. Um, I was the first American to work uh, at the Auschwitz Museum uh, in, in Poland, and I'm gonna talk about my experiences there. But I wanna give a special thanks out to the Holocaust and Genocide Center here at Bristol Community College. Um, thank you so much for this invitation, and especially to Ron and Emily, right? Uh, Emily and I have known each other. We actually traveled in Europe uh, together um, this past year. And so thank you for this amazing uh, and important opportunity to be here. Um, I'm gonna cover the, a long history of Auschwitz, but I mean, that's hard as well, right? Within the time frame. I know I have about an hour, but I want to make this really conversational, really. So it's not so much a lecture on the history, more about my experiences um, going there, working there, and how I came and, and uh, had to deal with this history, right, being there. Um, and so, in short, right, this is really sort of conversational, and I'm gonna pull m from my experiences. Um, even though I really don't have a direct tie to this history, um, I could also argue um, that is questionable as well, right? But this talk is really shaped by events and things that I've witnessed, and the difficult history experience from my time being in the city. So the city, just to give you a quick, uh, it's Oshvenshim, um, which took me a long time actually to, to learn how to say. Uh, when I got there, I did not speak Polish, by the way. Um, so, but I have since uh, learned. And uh, so I will talk a lot about Oshvenshim. And when I say Oshvenshim, I mean the city, right? So. Uh, and I'll talk about that pre-war. This was a Polish city, and then the Nazis took over, renamed it Auschwitz, of course, built a death camp, and a, or a concentration camp and a death camp. Um, and uh, in the post-war period, it was, of course, went back to its original name. The city is called Auschwitz. Um, of course, I, will, I, I sort of make an argument, but again, this is conversational. So if you have questions or something is not clear, just raise your hand, or we can, we can talk about it during... Um, but I want to save time at the end for questions as well. Um, I really am going to argue that Auschwitz, um, what we know, and I'm talking the museum, the city, the locals, this history, it's not monolithic, right? Um, it, it's very, very uh, difficult and very layered. Uh, I'm going to also introduce you to this word palimpsest, uh, which I'll talk about in detail, um, because there are various symbolic, sacred, and difficult meanings and perspectives. And as you will see, multiple groups come to this one place, right? Um, Oshvenshin was forever changed because of the Nazi occupation in those five years. And today, it is a very, very important museum, right? Um, that everyone should go and see what happened um, at that site. I don't want to give too much away, but either go to the site, or actually you could take a virtual reality tour of it today as well. Um, but we must remember that it, it is, of course, above all, the largest uh, Jewish cemetery in the world. So looking at this history 79 years after its liberation, um, 
Auschwitz was liberated on the 27th of January, 1945. So we are 75 years removed, right? I wonder how the memory has shifted and how it's going to actually shift in the future too, right? This is just a, a short, quick talk about how things have changed over time there on the ground, right, with the city and with the museum, but it's definitely going to shift in the future. So I always start with, oh, I'm glad this is working. Um, uh, so uh, in 2007, I accompanied an Israeli group. One of my jobs working at the museum was to work with uh, Israeli educators from Yad Vashem. We, we had a long uh, seminar and we stopped on the Soa River, really beautiful place. Uh, at this camping site called Zwati Stok uh, in the uh, mountain region. It's about 25 minutes outside of the museum of Auschwitz, right? Um, but we went to this uh, nice camping place and we sat down for coffee and tea because the seminar participants had been in this long, uh, yeah, very long seminar and we wanted to go somewhere nice and have some coffee, sit down. And when we sat down and had our cake, uh, the historian started passing around pictures um, of the SS during the Auschwitz period, right? Now, remember, this is 2007, right? Um, most disturbing, um, and you may be familiar with these pictures, right? Um, these are, uh, this was a personal album from SS Carl Hooker. Uh, it was identified as taken in the summer of 1944. Um, and essentially, it illustrates, right, Nazis happy at play, right, and having fun. This was marked, though, we understood it was in the summer of 1944, the biggest killing time of the Auschwitz uh, camp, right? Um, this is the summer where uh, Hungarian Jews were sent uh, every day, all day, to be murdered at Auschwitz. But they are here, right, um, on this retreat, having fun, playing, relaxing, having a good time. And so a lot of the seminar's uh, demeanor, the participants changed, right, to disgust, intrigue, and fascination. Looking at these pictures, they started walking around, looking at, at what, what was um, the former, what you could see from the pictures, right? This is sort of the, the patio, the bridge, right? Looking at these different things and seeing uh, where these, these pictures were from and the SS were standing. Um, a lot of them walked around uh, looking for um, the sites where uh, Joseph Mengele are in these pictures, uh, Richard Baer, uh, Karl Hooker, the Commandant of Auschwitz, Hearst, was in these pictures, right? And others inspected the railing, right, where females were uh, auxiliary uh, uh, SS, were eating blueberries and then feigned their upset. They were very upset that they ate all their blueberries. Um, and one participant said, as they stood around there, I see Nazis, right? So this past and present sort of mixed, even just sitting there um, looking at these places. The thing that really intrigued me though, was one of my, um, and this is a picture as you can see of uh, Joseph Mengele and the Commandant of Auschwitz at the door of the, the SS retreat, right? The interesting part was, as I was standing there, taking all this in, being overwhelmed, was that my colleagues from the, uh, from the Auschwitz Museum said, wow, I did not know this history. I actually came here as a child and remember this is my uh, camping retreat. And I was shocked, right? I was like, how could this be, right? A, this isn't memorialized. Um, they went there uh, as a summer retreat because their family uh, under communism, this was also used as a summer retreat for uh, uh, communist workers who worked at the chemical factory in the city of Oshvenshim. So this has a long history and it, they are just finding out today, right, that um, this was built by prisoners, used by the SS as a summer retreat, and particularly in the summer of 44, right? So really, really hard layered history. But for my museum colleagues, they had a very different understanding of this place. They remember running through the creek, right, staying in this, in this place, right? where my Israeli colleagues and myself just saw the Nazi history, right? So this small period, right? And it was built by prisoners, um, really forever changed how um, we see this site today, right? Um, interestingly, uh, one of the survivors who actually uh, was forced to build this place, uh, I talked to him and he said, Actually, I have a very different perspective. I spent my summer here one, one summer and I stayed in the same um, room that Commandant Hearst stayed. And he's like, guess what? Hearst isn't here today. Uh, I am, right? 
And so that really hit me too, thinking about this local history, right? Thinking about how I'm viewing this place. And a lot of the participants were like, we have to memorialize this. We have to keep this place sacred. Um, we need to know this history. Um, I interviewed the, uh, the owner and unfortunately it was very outdated. There was no plumbing, right? And he was competing in 2007 with big hotels that were coming into the area, right? So unfortunately, his plan was to take this down um, and to build a new hotel. Um, of course, economic reality, right? So he tried for a little while to find out if there could be, uh, this place could be memorialized. Unfortunately, nobody would. Um, the Auschwitz Museum said, um, it, we can't do it. We already have too much that we are you know, keeping intact. Who would actually go see it? It's 25 minutes from Auschwitz unless there are special study groups. How are we going to keep this unless there's funding, right? So unfortunately, um, I detailed uh, its dismant dismantlement. And um, it is today, sadly, this is a picture from 2017. I had to look at the year. Still to this day, there's nothing there. The owner did dismantle it and try to keep and save as much as possible, but it was taken down, right? So, and I use this um, as an example of how many different perspectives and the reality of what can be memorialized, what can't be memorialized, right? I want to have to keep everything, right? I want to remember all of this history, but sometimes it's just not practical, right? Um, so I want to give you a little bit of background of where I got to this point with just even the Soahuta. And these are very famous photographs, right? The, the, there's very few photographs that we actually have. And I wish that this was still around today. And I wonder actually if we're going to forget about it or, for me more importantly, are we going to forget about the post-war history of this site, right? Because all we are going to talk about is the Nazi period. Right, which I think actually does sort of a disservice to this site, in my opinion, right? So a little bit of background, this is me um, in uh, my office at the Auschwitz Museum. Um, it is a rather long story, which I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but I, was, uh, I started there in 2005 as the first American. Um, believe you me, they did not think that I was gonna come and work there. Um, they just, my boss at the time kept telling me, we're not paying for anything, you must have insurance, and guess what, we're not paying for anything. And I was like, okay, I'm coming. And she did not believe that I would. They, the Auschwitz Museum had just started the International Center for Education about Auschwitz and the Holocaust. And my boss, Alicia Biowetska, uh, was amazing. And she said, you know what, if we're gonna have an international center, we should have international people working here um, because uh, it is a state museum, right? So only Polish uh, citizens can work at the Auschwitz Museum, just to let you know. Um, so even though technically I worked there, I was not an official, uh, official employee, right? But I did work for the International Center of Education. And this was my first summer. They didn't know what to do with me. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know Polish, right? And so they, they put me um, in with the um, Israeli educators group who they were like, oh, we have a native English speaker, right? And one of my other jobs was to go through and just correct the English uh, um, uh, text at the museum, which I have to say was not so good, right? So at the time, um, and we'll talk about why and that, how that is, right? But I started in 2005, and I'll tell you what a shock. Uh, I got there as a, uh, an American, and as I said, it's Auschwitz, right? Very overwhelming. I lived in the Commandant Tour building um, at Auschwitz uh, on the camp or at the site. Um, it's not part, it is not on the tour of the museum, but it is uh, right beside this. This is, it's the second floor, I think it's the sixth window, it was my uh, apartment. And this was um, a place where uh, they put scholars, they put visiting. Uh, uh, researchers, right? And this all started because in the post-war period, um, the survivors who survived and were the actual museum workers and those who gave tours needed a place to live, right? They had been expelled from their homes, they had nowhere to go, and they knew that they had to uh, keep this education about this place alive. And so they put the families there, and there are still families there today. I have to say, I know this is being recorded, the museum does not like to talk about it, but there are still families that live there today that have ties to the original museum, right? And there are still some places uh, and, and uh, apartments there. Um, I, I liked my apartment. Um, it was a little daunting that I lived right there and I worked in the next building in the front, actually, 
which is where the education center was, and that is located beside crematoria and gas chamber one. So my daily life uh, at that time was living right beside there, right? Every day I would live there and uh, go to work in my office next door. So, and this was a traditional with survivors and scholars to be there. Um, and then after that summer, and I'll give a quick, um, I worked, I lived in the next summer in the extension camp. Uh, so Auschwitz one, we can think of the Arbeit macht frei sign, the brick buildings. There was also a full camp uh, next to it that you would not even know today if you went because it's now uh, total put stucco and it's painted, but that was an extension camp as well. And it was turned into apartments for post-war um, prisoners who came back to Auschwitz. And there was no school, there was no church, they had to live somewhere, everything had been taken over by the SS. And so they used the extension camp and, and I also lived in the apartments there, right? So I was really getting this full history of living there um, and being surrounded by this history on multiple levels, which was really difficult for me at the time, right? To this day, I mean, I, I still am taken back by certain things, but um, yeah, it was, it was a pretty tough year working and living there and being surrounded because everything was symbolic to me, right? Um, but when I talked to my colleagues, when I talked to the locals, they would say, look, if we were to memorialize everything, this, there would be no city, right? Everything was touched by this camp, everything. Um, my uh, advisor and uh, mentor, Deborah Dwork, would say, who wrote a book on Auschwitz, would say, um, you know, in, during the wartime, not much was being built, right? Things were being destroyed. Oshvenshin was being built, and I'm going to tell you why the city was being built up um, in particular, right? Um, and Oshvenshin is an ordinary town, uh, actually, in Poland. It was established around 1270. It developed into a market town. And the city experienced typical Polish-Jewish relations. The city before the war was 60% Jewish. So it was considered a Jewish city, right? Um, uh, mainly the Jewish community lived in the center of the city, Polish Christians lived out, but they would all meet in the center. There was a lively community. They went to school together in the day and then went to religious school in the afternoon, right, separately. So uh, that is the history of Oświęcim before the war. Of course, we know today, and I will talk about this, there are no Jews alive uh, that live in Oświęcim today. They were, of course, murdered during the Holocaust, and the small community that came back um, eventually left. Uh, but I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but I have to say, the issue is Oshvinch and Auschwitz, right? Everything is symbolic, everything there. I, if you walk around and you know the history, everything is going to hit you. For example, this first picture, as I said, is the Commandant Tour building. Um, if you've seen the new film, which I highly recommend, Zone of Interest, um, if you see that film with the Commandant's uh, house, um, that is literally right beside this, where I stayed. Um, and I'll talk about that importance in a second. Um, the second part is the extension camp. This is also, if you see the rose garden here, this was the last hanging at Auschwitz of the women uh, from the munitions factory who smuggled uh, gunpowder to the Sonderkommando, those working in crematorium, Aus uh, crematorium gas chamber uh, five, I'm sorry, four, um, at Auschwitz, and they, they blew it up and revolted. And so these, this was the last hanging at Auschwitz for revolt. Um, but you wouldn't know that, right, unless you knew this history, right? Unless you specifically, no visitors know this, I will tell you that. Visitors only go to see the museum, typically for about three and a half hours. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, Emily, I don't know, I made Emily do a seven hour uh, trip in, for one day, um, but we did a full extensive, and that's not even enough, I have to tell you. And then this is also the post-war reality, right? The chemical factory built a lot of residents around the area, and uh, a lot of people came to, from there, right? So a very big mixed uh, uh, perspective being at this city. Uh, this is not uncommon to other places. This is Majdanek, right, outside of Lublin, Poland. Um, and this is a picture of the gas, uh, gas chamber. Uh, not this building, but the building with the bricks. That's the gas chamber. But you see there's residents, right, that live right, right in plain view of the museum and where it is. It's not uncommon. I've done a lot of work in Dachau. Um, Dachau, the homes are built right up against the wall of the memorial. Um, you can't help if you were there, you will see them. People live, right? Um, I interviewed most of the people who live there. 
uh, that house right there, the bathroom looks out into the, the former prison of Dachau, right? So this isn't uncommon of locals and uh, this community, these communities being involved in around the memorials themselves, right? Um, so although I would say it's sort of typical, but Oshvenshim is a little different, right? It's, 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 uh, it is the, the symbol and uh, epicenter of the Holocaust. Um, but Oshvenshim, during its time, as I said, it was one of the only cities to start to have things built during the time. Himmler, before the attack on the Soviet Union, one really, really, now I know this sounds uh, a little off, but Himmler loved the city of Oshvenshim, and he wanted to make it a model city, a German model city for the East. So he wanted it to be a model city, and that's why everything was starting to be built up in Oshvenshim. So everyone was expelled in the city except for a handful of people who were specialty workers. Um, that would be like miners, bakers, right, people, and it was colonized by Germans. So the city of Oshvenshim during the wartime from 1940 on, uh, everyone was expelled, even especially its 60% Jewish population, and only a few people were around, and they were Christian Poles who were special workers, right? Um, which plays in uh, importantly because it also became uh, the chemical factory. I'm sure you've heard of IG Farben, and that's one of the reasons Auschwitz became Auschwitz and so big because of the chemical factory. In the post-war period, you'll see the Polish government also used it as a chemical factory and brought a lot of people in the post-war period to the city as well. Um, this is uh, Clemens Schemian. He uh, lived in a village uh, outside of um, the main city of Oshvenshim, the village of Brzezinka, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, he and his family lived there for many, many, many centuries in, the, in this village. And when the Nazis took over, as they were expelling everybody, they expelled him and his family from Brzezinka and sent him across the city uh, to a place called Manowitz, which later turned into, I'm sorry, Manowice, which turned into Manowitz. You would know Manowitz because the chemical factory was built there and very famous survivors worked in the camp there including Elie Wiesel, Primo Levi, right? You've heard of these prisoners. But he was expelled, um, put to work to uh, take care of SS uh, horses. One of them died, and he was charged with, with uh, destroying German property, and he was put into the camp system. He returned to the camp system to find that his village of Virginka had been torn down, and everything except for two houses were torn down in his village. His entire family had lived there for centuries, and they built Birkenau, right? We know today of Birkenau. And literally he could see his, his door from his home, his windows as other villagers from Brzezinka because they had torn down all the homes to build the camp, right? They, when they got back, if they were sent to the camp, um, they would see their doors, their uh, windows, uh, the wood from their homes, their beautiful tiles that line Auschwitz I that are from Polish homes in the area, right? Um, and I talk about this because uh, I, this is his home in the post-war period. He later, he, he was fortunate, he survived, he came back, he built his home in the village of Brzezinka because he had lived there all of his life, not in the same place because the, uh, the um, Nazis had built a death camp on his, his home town, right? Um, but he did build his uh, house there, and he was the mayor of Brzezinka for many, many years, and he fought hard to keep the memory of Brzezinka alive, and not just Birkenau, right? Even though it is very important that we remember um, Birkenau, right? For him, as a local, um, it, it's a very, very different history. Uh, two things about Brzezinka and Birkenau, right? This is, um, this is the uh, white bunker, or house, uh, the white house ruins, in, uh, in Birkenau today. Very, very important part of the museum. If you are on a regular tour, you do not see this site, but if you're on a study tour, you will. It's passed um, outside. But as I said, remember, there were two houses that were not torn down in, in Birkenau, or in Brzezinka. They were used as provisional gas chambers before the four big gas chambers were built, right? And I use this example because today it's ruins. The Nazis, of course, dismantled it and destroyed it, just like they did the other crematoria and gas chambers in Birkenau. But today, right, if you go there, the museum and I will tell you the importance of this being a provisional gas chamber, and we must remember this, right? Very, very sacred site. But I will also tell you about how 
Clemens Shemian knew the people who lived there, right? They were expelled. Their homes were used. And I tell about that story too, because for him, there's multiple layers there. And I think that that's something, because most visitors go and just see homes around this, this area, like I showed you with Dachau, um, which is a different story. But in Oshvenshem, those people had lived there for many, many years, right? And they were expelled and came back and wanted to be in their hometowns, right? They didn't move. Um, they wanted to rebuild their lives there. This also is very important. This is the Brzezinka Church, right? Does it look sort of familiar? Because it, it's sort of a replica of the um, death gate at Auschwitz, right? Um, because it really is sort of a replica. It's right down the street. If you're standing at the gate going to the museum at Birkenau, you can see this. But nobody talks about it because it's a church today. And under communism, this building sat empty. And they wanted to use empty buildings, of course, right? And the village of Brzezinka was given the opportunity to use this as a church. There was a lot of debate, but they said, we need a church for our village. And so they did. And one of the people who I knew and interviewed, she, um, and again, these are just sort of anecdotes about locals and how they deal with this history. She had gone to this church all of her life. She grew up in Brzezinka, right? Um, in, in the recent history. And she went to have her wedding there. But she knew, she's like, how do I have my wedding in this church? When I come out of this church, guess what's going to be outside? Visitors to the museum, right? And she's like, and she said, I know that I understand this history, but I want to invite my friends from England. I want to invite my friends from even Bielsko Biawa, right? This is regional too. People who don't listen, live in Oshvenshem have this misconception about the locals too. Um, but she said, it's going to be a hard thing. And so she asked her fiance at the time and he said, oh, I don't care. Doesn't matter to me. And so she's like, great, now I have to deal with this. But she talked with her family, right, who had been at this church for a long time. And she finally decided, yeah, I am going to have my wedding here. This is my church. And I was like, wow. Like, I think I would have just said, no, I can't. I can't, you know, even though I can worship there, it literally is. I mean, if you're a, if you're a visitor, right, and you saw, like, a wedding party coming out, it would be kind of shocking, right? But this is something sort of I dealt with every day, right, having this different perspective. Um, Auschwitz is a memorial museum, and I want to quickly just touch upon this because it's important that a memorial museum is dedicated to historic event uh, commemorating mass suffering. It's a really hard and difficult thing to do. Uh, I would argue that Auschwitz is the first, um, and you see, right, it's a, it's a site museum, it has education, I'm not going to go too much into this, it is definitely active, right? You want people to go to Auschwitz to learn about the past, to to correct to talk about the present so it doesn't happen in the future right it's a very educational active social and political there's no question all museums are political it, it's just that is that that is the way right um that could be a whole lecture unto itself but i want to point out this quote at the bottom this is uh cashmere smolin he was uh, on the first transport to Auschwitz in uh, June 14, 1940, 728 Polish political prisoners were sent to Auschwitz, and that is what we, we say is the first date of the establishment of Auschwitz. And he later became a longtime director and interviewed about how did you make a museum? And he admits, he's like, we made lots of mistakes. We didn't know because this was anti-culture. It wasn't culture, right? Never before, right? Museums are supposed to celebrate culture, art, beauty, sculpture. This is commemorating genocide, right? It's very difficult. And they made mistakes. There are lots of mistakes that they did, but very, very important that we do, that we think about that. I would argue it's the first memorial museum, which is kind of not true. Actually, Majdanek was the first liberated and established as a memorial um, by the Soviets, but, um, at the time, because this was in 1944, no one believed what happened at Majdanek at that moment, right? And Auschwitz, of course, became the big symbol. And, and it was because of the prisoners, not the Soviets, because the prisoners wanted to make a memorial. That is why Auschwitz, I would say, is the first memorial museum, right? Even though the first commemoration, the first liberation of a death camp was Majdanek. But I would argue because of the prisoners wanting this uh, as a museum. It's very important. Now, I put the dates up here because the, the museum opened in 1947. Think about that. Two years from liberation, lots of things happened. SS were housed there. 
lots of locals and Poles came back because they had been expelled, right? And they lived on the grounds. They were rebuilding their lives. Prisoners were using it as a hospital, right? We know this, right? Lots of, there were also people coming and rebuilding their homes, dismantling the barracks that had been used to build from their homes, right? To build their own homes. Lots of things happened in these two years, right? Um, before the establishment of the museum. And because it was established in 1947, it was political. A lot of the, uh, uh, first, if you went there, very few people did, it was mainly locals. Um, you were given the narrative of what the prisoners had experienced, right? And mainly, let's be honest, Polish political Christian prisoners, right? Jew the Jewish prisoners were murdered, right? They weren't, tell they weren't their story was not being told. This sat as a um, uh, communist n narrative for many, many years, up until 1955, and that's why I put the two years. Most of the exhibition at Auschwitz is from 1955 to this day. Um, and why 1955? It's the 10-year anniversary of the liberation, and over the first couple years of the museum from 47, they realized this cannot be a museum about uh, communism and about what happened and that the West is wrong. Right? They realize this is an international place. Now, they still got it wrong. Right, They still look to national groups, not Jews, but they at least understood that this had to be an international place. Right Now, I'm going to take you through a couple of, of um, uh, major sort of uh, issues as well. Um, this is the uh, uh, a map of the environs of um, the Auschwitz camp. So there were three main camps, as you can see. I don't think my, my pointer, uh, no, oh yeah, oh, there's Auschwitz II, Birkenau, right? Auschwitz I. So if you think of Auschwitz I, that's this, the Arbeit Machfrei with the, with the brick buildings. That's only this. Remember I talked about the extension camp? That's the gray area right there. So you see there was a lot of things that are not memorialized today. Also, Auschwitz III Monowitz, where the chemical factory set, um, that was the third camp. And there were over 40 subcamps. We don't have the exact number. We think 42 or 44, but that still is up for debate. Um, but as you can see, the museum couldn't memorialize everything, right? And the city of Oshvenshim is right sort of in the middle, right here, right? So it's a vast, vast area. Not everything could be um, commemorated and memorialized. Um, if you were to go to the museum today, there is a new entrance, which I'll talk about in the beginning, but essentially you only see part of it. You go through here. This is where the Arbat Mike Fry sign is. You go under here, you go through here, and you only really go through these, a couple of these barracks um, for the exhibition. You, of course, uh, visit uh, Block 11, which is the, um, the prison block, right, and the gate of death. Very, very important. And then, so if you go in, you come through here, you're, you're taken through different barracks here, you walk out here and come through, you visit gas chamber one and crematoria one, and then you're on your way to Birkenau. That's only a three and a half hour tour, and you still have Birkenau, by the way, right? So it's very quick, very fast. Um, the thing in the middle, um, the, all of these barracks in the middle are so-called national pavilions. Very few people go there. I don't know, Emily, if you went to any of these, but um, national pavilions were brought about um, early on in the 50s, even though the first one wasn't open until 1960. Um, but these are all different exhibitions that are from every nation that, that um, was put was sent to Auschwitz as a prison group, right? So think about that. They are still thinking in ideas of uh, nationality, right? Problematic, right? Because Auschwitz is the site of the Jewish Holocaust, right? They didn't go to Auschwitz because they were Austrian. They went to Auschwitz because they were Jewish, right? And this is still to this day, every country um, has its own pavilion. Here are all the different pavilions. Um, importantly, there is to this day the um, the suffering, the original was the suffering, fight, and extermination of the Jewish nation between 1933 and 1945, Block 27, okay? Now, who put this together? The, the Auschwitz Museum workers, right? Because there was no nation, right, to make this national exhibition, and it was only one of a few, right? Um, clearly, there are big problems. If I go back, 
Um, this is the Austrian wine. And when you walk in, if you can't read German, it says we were the first victims of Nazism. Of course, that's not true, right? Um, Austria was completely allied with, with Hitler. There's no question, right? But there are big, big problems. The Russian exhibition has been shut down and reopened, I think, twice, right, at this point. Um, very, very problematic. These are all political. And I show this because um, this was really a closed off museum, right, under communism, right? So when lots of mistakes were made, they're still there to this day. Fortunately, Yad Vashem, the national museum in, uh, about the Holocaust in Israel, uh, redid the exhibition in Block 27, and it's now called Shoah. It opened in 2013. It's extremely powerful and very moving, right, Emily? It's, it's really, it's very, very, very moving. If you ever go and your guide is like, we're going to the next place, just say, no, I want to stop at Block 27. Very important place. Um, the other thing, Auschwitz is a site um, for many people who suffered there, right? Not only is it the site of um, the Holocaust, but it's the site of Polish martyrdom. Very important, right? Many Polish political prisoners were there from the beginning, right? I remember I said the first transport in 1940? There were two Jews in that transport, but they weren't considered Jews at that point. They were considered Polish prisoners, right? At that point, they weren't labeling them as Jewish prisoners, right? So this became also a very major site for um, Polish martyrdom. The Pope spoke there, John Paul II, uh, in 1979, uh, about this being the Golgotha of our time. Very, very important. And you know, when the Pope speaks, I'll show you a picture of him in a minute, becomes a very sacred place, right? Um, and it was very political, actually. I would argue it was the sort of the crack that, that sort of started uh, breaking away at communism. But um, this site is very important. If you remember, I showed you a picture of this today. This is the little White House up here, right? It's a very important place as well because um, in the 80s, a group of Polish Boy Scouts, I will call them, um, decided they wanted to do something, right, and remember the victims. So they put up a couple crosses here because uh, this was a gas chamber. Guess what? Big controversy, right? Crosses at Auschwitz. How can you do that? So Stars of David started coming. Then Birkenau became covered with, with crosses and uh, Stars of David. And uh, while the Polish uh, Boy Scouts were like, we are trying to just commemorate our, you know, those who we, we uh, you know, think it's important, um, the museum had to make a decision in the 80s, right? And their decision, which was right, was that, yes, anybody can put a, um, a cross or a symbol or anything that they want up at Auschwitz, but we are going to take it down every day because this is an international site and many, many victim groups were, were murdered here. Right. And so that's how instead of having uh, Birkenau covered with a bunch of symbols, this is how the Auschwitz Museum deals with it, um, which is also controversial because the um, the papal's cross, right, when the Pope spoke has been moved and it's still you can see it at Auschwitz one. It's sort of off grounds, but it's still there. Right. And that's still controversial to have a big cross as you're going through Auschwitz. Right. Um, but I want to show you this site of, of the bunker, too, because it's also a very important site. And I want to give you another reason of why this is really complicated. The Carmelite nun, Edith Stein, who you may have heard of, was murdered here in this gas chamber. And I, and I talk about her. Not only is there a sign there about Edith Stein, but Edith Stein is, is really important because Edith Stein was a Carmelite nun. But the Nazis knew that her heritage was she was Jewish. So she was sent to Auschwitz, even though she was a Carmelite nun, to be murdered there because she was Jewish, right? In their pseudoscientific Nuremberg law racial hierarchy, she was Jewish, even though she was a devout uh, Carmelite cloistered nun, right? So it becomes even more problematic of how we view this history, right? She was murdered there in um, August of 1942. People who go to Auschwitz, right? right? Lots of perspectives. Um, there are pilgrims, and I'm going to talk about this because when I started there, um, I would discuss with the um, director that not everyone going there is, you know, are pilgrims. But in his eyes, the, the museum director in 2005 was like, no, 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 very sacred site. All of the visitors here are going to be respectful. I'll talk about that in a second. But very important for pilgrimage. As you see, this is Pope, Pope uh, John Paul II. 
He is in the cell where Maximilian Kolbe, a, a Polish priest, gave his life up for another prisoner, right? He has sent, since become a saint. Very important, there are multiple uh, schools, churches named after Maximilian Kolbe. You may have heard of him. Very important person to uh, Catholicism and in very important uh, martyr. This is March of the Living. Uh, this was a group that was established in 1988. Uh, very, very important, mainly American Jewish groups who are going over to Poland. They walk from Auschwitz I to Auschwitz II after seeing many sites in Poland. And it is the March of the Living because, right, they are, they are generations of survivors, right? The Nazis did not win. This is every year on Yom HaShoah, um, it's coming up in May. It's, it is, there are so many people who go, and I think it's a really, really, really important event. But you see, right? And when I see this picture, this is a historical picture, because I, working at the museum, I would just beg everyone, do not walk on the ruins. But as you see, they're, u they're using the crematoria ruins um, as a platform to commemorate, right? Um, and so today, they cannot do this because it is sort of closed off in their security. But back then, you can see they um, are there. Also, the biggest group that goes to the Auschwitz Museum, not only tourists in the summer and pilgrims, but youth, right, school groups. Uh, great education in the city of Auschwitz. Uh, this is the uh, International Youth Meeting House for German, German and Pol Polish youth. They go there, they spend a week together, they talk about this history. German youth come to uh, um, Auschwitz, Poles go to Germany. Um, which I always find very interesting because my friends uh, who live in Auschwitz went to Dachau for a week program and I was like, not only do you live here, but you, then you have to go to Dachau? Like, wow, like, yeah, this is really tough, right? And they're like, yeah, we have a very different perspective though, right? We hung out with our friends and got to go to Germany and I was like, okay, maybe, you know, and we'll talk about age and, and how, how that is, but very important place. The, the um, building at the top, is the, uh, oh, why did I just lose it? The Center for Dialogue and Prayer. Center for Dialogue and Prayer, very interesting. There was a Carmelite convent, and I'm not gonna go into that, at Auschwitz I, which had to be removed. It was very controversial. They ended up putting the nuns here. There's a cloister of nuns who, who pray here, but this also became a very important place for um, Christian dialogue. Lots of conferences, lots of education, um, many people go here and have conferences, uh, very, very important, um, uh, headed by a German priest, uh, really, really uh, amazing person who's done great work. I am particularly interested in the bottom picture here. This is the Auschwitz Jewish Center. It is a synagogue. It's the only, it's the only remnant synagogue of the city of Auschwitz. Remember, I said Auschwitz was 60% Jewish. The great synagogue, synagogue was burnt down, of course, by the Nazis. But this, this was still standing when, they, when it became the Jewish center. Um, when it was founded, it was used in the post-war period as a rug warehouse, but it was. And today, it's a very important place where um, you can go and learn about the history of the 60% Jewish population before the war and Jewish, Polish Jewish relations, right? Pre-war, very, very important. There is a synagogue there today. There is a great museum. Um, I work with them a lot. I highly recommend if you're ever there. There's also a cafe, but that's a whole other story. They have really good... My Oshanshan friends would say they have the best cake in the city, but that I'm being biased. Um, also, the house where the cafe is, is the last standing house of the last Jew of Oshanshan. His name was Shimon Kluger. Um, he, he came back in the post-war period and stayed there. Uh, he left a couple of times, but he came back, and his home was still there. When he passed away, he donated... Um, this to the, the center to be used. And today it's a meeting place. The most important thing about this out of these three places, right? The other two are for outside education. The, the one, the Auschwitz Jewish Center, while they love visitors coming, it is about teaching the locals this history, right? It's about reminding the locals that there was Jewish history here because the communist period had sort of erased that, right? So very, very, very important place. Um, at least I think so. Okay, not only do pilgrims and people who are going there for education go, um, we also have a mass influx of locals coming because the chemical factory, if you remember, was used in the post-war period as well. 
I would argue the two, the two things that really made Oshvenshim Oshvenshim in the post-war period was workers coming to the chemical factory, number one, right? And remember I said my colleagues had seen the Soahuta, right, because of this, and those working at the museum. That is why Oshvenshim has become Oshvenshim. And in the post-war period, it was a very important city. Many dignitaries, many presidents went there, right? Uh, I can show you pictures of Hillary Clinton there, right? And, um, who was just there? Uh, I think Arnold Schwarzenegger just went to the Auschwitz Jewish Center like two weeks ago and toured, right? So very, very important place for people. Um, and the locals also knew that they lived in a very important place. But with the fall of communism, lots of problems, right? There is mass and dark tourism happening, right? I argued with my the director in 2005. I said, look, these are not, as I said before, these are not just pilgrims who are coming. And he was like, no, 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 it's fine. Um, you know, when I started, I was telling Ron this earlier, there were three guards at, at the Auschwitz Museum. Three. Two at Auschwitz, one, one in the back, one in the front uh, gate, and one at Birkenau, right? I would sometimes see groups after hours, and I would go down and be like, why are they here? And the museum was very flexible then and said, look, they came here after hours. This is their only time they can come. We let them in. And I, I was like, we can't, you can't do this, right? But I don't know. My American perspective, I was like, I don't know. We shouldn't probably be doing this, right? Because people were not treating the site very well. My first experience going to Birkenau as a visitor before I started working there, I walked on a group of people <laughs> stealing the conductors off the fence post as a souvenir. I saw people taking bricks. I saw many, many things there, um, people stealing things. Uh, and also, as you see, right, selfies, like the early selfie in front of the Zyklon B cans. Um, this is a uh, youth group that this person posted this picture in, in the oven. Um, they were there on a school group. The, the um, guide had walked out. She got in the oven, took a picture, and it became national news. If you don't know Princess Brianna, um, if you've never heard of her, excuse me, she was the first controversial selfie at Auschwitz, right? And if you can't read it, it says, selfie in Auschwitz concentration camp with a smiley face, right? Um, really problematic, and she doubled down. She, she really pushed back on this, and everyone was in an uproar because she's smiling, taking a selfie at Auschwitz. I promise you I've seen definitely even groups like do peace signs, smile in front of the Arbeit Mark Fry sign. I've seen many, many things. Um, but Princess Brianna defended it and said she was going there. Her, she studied this history with her grandfather and that he had passed away and she wanted to see it and she was very happy to be there. This was not taken well, right? Um, I also tell the story of um, that when I was working there, uh, Pavel Savitsky was hired to just combat, as one person, to combat uh, inter the internet saying that it was a Polish concentration camp. Of course, Auschwitz was not a Polish concentration camp. It was a Nazi camp um, on former Polish land. It was actually incorporated into the Reich. But he would combat this misinformation. Other things that we had to talk about, right? One of the biggest things that always hits home to students, we had to talk to, about Pokemon Go. People were playing Pokemon Go around Auschwitz on the environs, right? On their phone, looking for these, I don't know how you do it, but the Pokemon uh, people and collecting uh, things. Today, train tracks, right? People were always walking on the train tracks, taking selfies. Lots of inappropriate things. Um, at least today now, they, they have decided there are two places you cannot take photos. And if there, if there is inappropriate behavior, the guides will stop you and say something, right? I was always a little bit hesitant, but my colleagues had no issues with, with stopping people doing inappropriate things. I think it was um, uh, very, very important. But you see, right, this site isn't always treated as sacred as everyone would think. I have to also say, with my Israeli groups, there were many Israeli youth who wanted to pray in the, the ash ponds, right? I don't feel that that is appropriate for me to step on that ground. But for them, it was perfectly, you know, this is something they, need, they wanted to do, right? And my point is there's lots of perspectives, lots of things happening, right? But mass tourism, very, very important because pre-COVID, Auschwitz had 2 million visitors. And let me tell you, those visitors were only coming mainly in the summer, 
right? We're not talking people are going to Poland in the winter. I know you may think that might be a fun vacation, but uh, these are mainly people who are coming in the summer, right? So it has to be regulated in many ways. And you'll see, right, these sites, and it has not reached 2 million again since COVID, but it's going to. There's no question. Um, that is where we're going. Um, with all of these visitors, the other thing that a museum has to worry about, I know because I've done many groups from Krakow, mainly visitors come from Krakow. There's an hour and 20 minute bus ride. If traffic is good, the first thing that they need to do is go to the restroom, right? Um, oh wait, I'm gonna talk about that in a second. This used to be, but they changed the entrance, the snack bar at Auschwitz. You would get off the bus. Um, there was a place for coffee, refreshments. The first thing is the in the basement, there was a bathroom, right? But you don't think about Auschwitz having to have bathrooms, snacks, things like this. But with two million visitors, you have to have these things, right? So, quick story. The museum understood that this snack bar in, in the middle of Auschwitz, and by the way, if you don't know the history, and you most visitors don't, you're already in the camp at this point. This is just a parking lot that was used, right? And it's part of the camp. Um, but they realized the snack bar is not going to fly too much, right? People are going to get upset. So they asked the locals to come up with a solution. Um, a local come up with a solution and built a little uh, place over the Auschwitz. So Auschwitz one where you just saw is over here. And he built a little uh, plaza over here with bathrooms, parking, a restaurant, things like that. Immediately, guess what? Supermarket Auschwitz hit the, hit the international press. Um, he fought this for years. Sadly, the museum did not back him up, um, which I am very disappointed in that. Um, but his name is Marshawik, and he built this place, fought against uh, the museum and international uh, press for many, many years. He later became the mayor and ran a program for many, many years um, against the museum. Because he was saying, he's like, we cannot even have life here in the city because of this, right? Because everything in the city is just associated with Auschwitz. And I'm asked to build a market. There are all these visitors. They have to have a go to a place. They need, this also had, just to let you know, reality, when I worked there, the only internet cafe in the entire city, right? I walked 40 minutes twice a week to go to this internet cafe, right? Because there wasn't internet at that point when I started working there, right? So uh, very, very problematic, right? Because everything is symbolic. And I know this may sound funny, but they just got their first McDonald's in the city of Oshvenshim. It's far away from the museum, but it was a huge, huge, huge thing, right? And the locals were like, every other city has a McDonald's, every other city has a KFC. We may take that for granted, but that's all they ever really wanted, the locals, right? They wanted, to, they wanted to have a McDonald's. It sounds weird, right? But they couldn't because McDonald's wouldn't invest in Oshvenshim because Oshvenshim is Auschwitz, right? And that's highly problematic. Um, I'm not gonna go into this. Real quick, Disco System. This was a uh, building that was used um, in the wartime as a tannery building. Right? and prisoners worked there. In the post-war period, it was a building that sat empty. A local bought it and turned it into a disco. One of the only discos in Oshvenshim, I know this sounds funny, right? But guess what, same thing, right? People, big uproar. Now, this building was a building that housed the hair that was taken from prisoners, right? I have done my own research that this, the, where the disco sat was not where the hair was, right? It was in a building next to it, yes, but the locals would say, there's no regulations, there's no zoning, this is perfectly fine, and we need to move on. Again, the local perspective is, if you were to preserve everything that was touched by the Auschwitz Museum and murder, we wouldn't have a city, right? This, of course, was shut down. Um, which actually was a big turning point, this is part of my research, that, that it really shifted things that the locals started leaving the city of Oshvenshim, right? Even though they, they had been born there, they had lived there, they were proud of their city, this was one of the breaking points where they left because they couldn't even have a disco or a bar in their city because it's so associated with the past. Um, today, uh, it caught fire after it was closed, and then it was torn down. It became bathrooms for a big festival, this land, and today it's a big shopping mall. So how things have changed within 20 years, right? 
that 20 years ago, there's no way this could have happened. Today, nobody would even flinch, right? That, there's some, that there was something there. And like with the Soahuta, nobody talks about this. I do, right? But I am one person, right, who is trying to keep this uh, difficult and layered memory alive. Um, Another thing that more museums have to deal with is hiding the perpetrators. If you saw the this new film, Zone of Interest, it's about the Commandant Hearst and his wife. This is the house that they lived in, which is right next to Auschwitz I and right behind Crematoria I and Gas Chamber I. And the museum was given this house at one point in the communist period, and, and guess what they said? We don't want it. We, and this is something that memorial museums have to deal with, right? How do we remember the victims? And even though the perpetrators are very important, we don't want neo-Nazis coming and having this as a site of pilgrimage, right? So to this day, this house uh, is owned by a local. Um, and yeah, no one talks about it. They do met, what they do mention when you're at the museum, where Hearst was hanged in the post-war period, that gallows is right there. And if you look to the right, you can see the home that he lived in but rarely do they talk about it because actually they don't want to at all talk about the perpetrators, right? Which is difficult for other memorials like Dachau, for example. You, it's hard to hide the perpetrators when that was the SS training ground, right? So they have their own strategies, but very, very important. If you didn't know, you would never even know that that was his house. Um, other things to consider, Auschwitz has a room of hair. How do you preserve that, right? Nobody had ever had to preserve this. Shoes, suitcases, they're made of different material from metal, you know, leather, right? How do you preserve that? And it's important to preserve it and conserve it, but it's very difficult. Um, the Auschwitz Museum came up with their own, uh, they built their own preservation department, which is really important. Also, age uh, appropriate, which I'm going to talk about in a slide or two. But again, how do you deal with even the Commandant's villa? because there are so many people going today, remember what I said about the two guards? Very different today because at some point the Arbat Mike Fry sign was stolen, um, cut into three pieces. It was recovered. This also happened at Dachau. The main gate was stolen as well. Um, but today, mass security, mass um, regulations, you have to have an ID to go there. They've built a new entrance and a new way to go in. You go through metal detectors, everything is searched, right? To sort of combat this because as you can see, people write things, right? Um, they've started cleaning this up, which is great, but you'll still see like, Steve was here, 1985, right? Um, which just really sickens me because it's such a sacred site and I think it's so important. But not everybody who goes there is, you know, understands exactly how sacred this place is. Also age appropriateness, right? One of the other big discussions we always had at the museum was how old should you be to go to this museum, right? Um, the, instead of asking, because it's, it's already going a little over, um, 14 is the age they recommend, but they can't turn people away. How do you turn people away, right? So you'll see in Auschwitz, people with strollers and babies and children walk, running around, right? Um, and so we, and I'm saying we as the museum, um, even though I haven't worked there in a while, we would say, right, that it's, it's more important that people go there and see this, that we don't turn them away. We, there was also at one point in the early years discussion of a daycare there, but they were like, we cannot separate people from their children, right? Just let people go and visit this memorial. But you see how difficult, right, these things are and how we have one perspective going into it, our own perspective, and me as an American, right, I had my own issues and my own thoughts about how the museum should be run, but there were so many practical things that had to be understood, right? Um, new, new realities, technology, this is the new one, right, that's sort of like, right? The Auschwitz Museum does do a virtual reality tour, by the way, you can join. Um, they just launched it this past year. But other places, right, there are holograms of survivors you can talk to and have discussion with, right, through the uh, Shoah Foundation, very important. Um, at Bergen-Belsen, this is the, the bottom one, there are these um, like screens that you can walk around and it's augmented reality, you can hold it up. And if like some building like the SS barrack was torn down, you can see it through the, the iPad, right? Really, really important things. Um, 
that uh, I think technology is helping us in many ways. But then you also have the, uh, it's an Oculus, I always get it wrong. Anyway, the glasses that you put on, and you're sort of in this virtual reality. I've done a tour of Birkenau in these, right? It's only 20 minutes, and it's sort of a flyover, right? Not my favorite thing, but, um, you know, this is where we're going. This is what's happening. Uh, and we have to be up on this, and I think it's a little scary for me as an educator, but I'm trying to roll with it, right? Um, but it's something we have to deal with. I mentioned to you before, the exhibition is from 1955, right? Very, very little of the Auschwitz Museum exhibition has changed since 1955. That sounds, right, just out of this world. But they don't need to change it, in my opinion. Um, it's powerful. You walk into rooms of things. You walk into the former barracks. You are there in the site, right? Very, very important. Um, I don't think that they need much. They did, however, open up a new entrance. Emily, I'm going to shout out to her because she was one of the last people on my group uh, to go through the old entrance of the museum, which is a very different experience, I think. She would agree with me. But now there is a state-of-the-art uh, reception building, as you can see up here in the the top, you go in there, you meet with your group, you actually will go underground now, which I don't agree with, but that's the way they built it. As you can see, these doors open and you are down underground, you walk down and then you walk through this cement where names are being t uh, told of the prisoners, right, who were murdered there. It's very powerful. And the Auschwitz Museum's um, uh, statement on this is that they want you to know that, that you are entering the world of Auschwitz before you actually go into the camp. They want you to be ready, right? I don't know if I agree with that, by the way, I have to say, and I don't work there, because I have spent most of my time working at this museum saying, you are coming to a museum in 2024. You are not in Auschwitz 1945. And I'm not saying they're trying to say that it is Auschwitz 1945. But you can somehow get that sense that you're going to walk into this world that is in the 1940s. And I think that that's sort of problematic in many ways, right? Um, very, very layered. Oh, I'm sorry, he had to like, whew, yeah, <laughs> better than I. Um, okay, quick final thoughts because I want to open it up. I talked way too long, but, right, thinking about how these things are constructed, these multiple layers, how is this going to shift in the future with new technologies, right? And I don't know, like I hope that things are gonna go right, but I'm always critical, right? I'm a historian, I'm supposed to be critical of everything, but you know, like I, I think that there are some things going well, and I think there are some things that I, I'm really, really hesitant and scared about um, of the way we are educating and the way we are, are telling this history, right? Especially with how do you deal with the local um, and the heritage of the place itself? With this new entrance, remember the supermarket I told you and all that business that was for the locals? It's gone. Completely gone. You can't... I, I was really upset that if I wanted to go over there, it would have taken a 45-minute walk around the museum. You are now really encased in the museum. You can't get out of <coughs> it. And, and I, I think that that's an issue for me because you've now cut off the local interaction. Right? There are people who work there from the local community, no question. But the businesses that were able to um, you know, have these amenities, that's all gone now. So um, it's really enclosed in the museum. So with that, I will stop talking. I hope it was interesting. I touched upon a lot of different things. Um, but thank you for, for listening and uh, for engaging in this. So. Thank you. And I will open it up to questions. And no, you cannot play Pokemon Go. So sorry, that's just the way it is. Um, yes, please. Um, over the last so many years, I'm thinking of the, the national governments in Poland. Oh, yes. And they have made comments sort of diluting, we'll politely say, their uh, involvement and complicity in, in the Holocaust. How do they view? This museum that attracts millions of visitors a year, how do they reconcile their position that we, uh, we want to downplay this history, but then we have this place 
that is going to be there long term? Yes. Amazing question, right? And it, this goes, oh, because I'm a historian, I'm going to tell you the history of it, right? Sorry. But here we go. So every museum is political, very much so. There's no question. And, and all museums, except for the 9-11 memorial, is, is somehow affiliated with the government that they are in, right? Um, even the U.S. Holocaust Museum is tied to the federal government and makes statements that are political, by the way, right? And doesn't always get it right. Remember Kashmir Smolin, the, one, of the the, one of the first political prisoners, then later director of the museum? Under communism, he would not sign into being a communist, and he was like, this site is not going to have that political um, uh, you know, narrative. He was very anti-government and fought hard. That is why, in those few years, they switched it to an international view. They couldn't always, as we know, Auschwitz before um, 1989, well, the 90s, but before 1989, they said six million Jews were murdered there, right? Or, I'm sorry, four million were murdered at Auschwitz. They had to change those numbers because they were saying the wrong thing, right? Um, and that was the government, and that was them saying, make this bigger, right? And only focus on national, right, groups. So I would say and other museums have gotten this wrong, especially there have been some issues with Treblinka Memorial and having uh, a distortion of history. The Auschwitz Museum, I think, has done a very good job because they have stuck with that 1955 exhibition that they don't have to be political. They are literally showing you what happened there, right? And the museum workers specifically, and they have a story, right, from this summer, they will stop political discussion immediately. It's not going to happen on the site. And that's the good thing about when I worked there, as a, as a worker and the directors would say, if something is not right, you say it, right? If there were neo-Nazis or people, you know, distorting history or denying, immediate removal. There was no tolerance for it. So even though the museum is a federal museum, I think that they have been able to do a very good job of staying away. At, and the current director as well has been very good about not being political, right? There are always missteps, but they have done a very good job at that museum. Others, not so much. And it's been, in fact, Ron and I were talking, there's another museum, the Pauline Museum, right, for the history of uh, Polish Jews uh, that's in Warsaw. Very problematic. They had removed the director. The government had put in their own director, right? We saw this in Hungary. My friends were fired from the Holocaust Museum there, and they rewrote the narrative of the Holocaust Museum in Hungary, right, with this right-wing government. It, but at least Auschwitz was able to maintain this, this semi-non-political, right? But if you start looking at the statements of the US Holocaust Museum as well, it's problematic. The government still has a say, right? And that's why I said these are all political in many, many ways. Yeah. And that's why it's important for us as educators and people in this in this um, field to really speak out, right? And there have been really good people working against what's going on. Yeah, good question, right? The political question. <laughs> I have wowed you with. Oh yes. People that work there. Mm -hmm. It's a great question. So most of the staff members, so there's, so I, I forgot to say this too. When I started there in 2005, which is very interesting, and I, this is a difference, right? Because um, my work looked at the city of Oshvinchen and the city of Dachau. When I started there, and I'm, I hope I remember this number correctly, there were 248 full-time employees at the Auschwitz Museum, right? And I'm talking from administration historians to the cleaners, right? The workers who are cleaning, um, the maintenance staff. At Dachau, do you want to guess how many people worked at Dachau in 2005? No guess, anyone? No. 2.5, right? Two full-time and one part-time. Why? Because think about East-West, right? Dachau is in Germany um, and Oświęcim is in Poland. It's a victim nation, right? And so we want to remember this history, we want to, right? We're in Dachau, there was so much resistance in the post-war period, we are very, very lucky to have that. In fact, I have interviewed many people who live there. There is a certain group, not the majority, 
They would say plow over Dachau, by the way. So now there are more workers there, I promise you. I think there's a bigger, there's a much bigger staff at Dachau, but um, things have changed recently. But your question about the, the workers, they are mostly local because they're Polish. And as I said, if in the period that I started there, and especially after, during the communist period, the two jobs in the city of Oświęcim was the chemical factory or being a guide at the Auschwitz Museum, and it was relatively good money, right? Um, they have had over the years with this new international um, education uh, department that I worked at, more international people working there. Fortun unfortunately, they don't stay very long. Um, when I worked there, I was not allowed to officially guide, even though I did. Don't take that off. Um, but officially, I'm not. And I have to say that the training for guides, it's like a two-year process. And they also have to like go through with the three main historians and give them a tour. Very daunting. I don't know if I could do that. Also, like with English-speaking guides, right? because there's different languages, um, I would go around and listen to the guides and correct English or misstatements and things like that. So, you know, when they would see me, they'd be like, oh, here he comes, uh-oh. But the, they're mainly locals because that's, you know, they, they're not coming from around. There is, though, side note, Israeli guides, ha there's a government agreement between Israel and Poland that Yad Vashem trained guides, they have to be an official guide, can guide in, in uh, Hebrew, if they have the official documents. But it used to be, and I don't know if this is still the case, I need to check this, the Polish guide had to go with them, but they never understood what they were saying, right? Um, but there, that's really the only exception, that Yad Vashem trained guides were allowed to still give tours uh, if they were officially trained. But it's really, really reg regulated in many ways, for a good reason, right? We don't want misinformation. Also, in Dachau, I was called out uh, last year. Um, I was talking to my students um, outside the crematory at Dachau, and somebody came up to me and was like, excuse me, are you guiding? And they said this in German. So I pretended I didn't know German, and I was like, I don't know what you're saying. And turned back around, and they were like, excuse me, are you guiding? And I was like, um, I don't know what you're saying. Can you speak English? And then he said, he goes, look, are you guiding? And I was like, no, I'm not guiding. These are my students. And he's like, OK. And then he walked away. I turned back to my students. And then he came back and he's like, you're guiding. And I'm like, I'm not guiding. I'm answering my students' questions because it is against the law to guide at Dachau unless you are affiliated and completely trained and have credentials. And they will stop you 100%, right? Um, that's good, I think. But I also think you should be able to recognize, you know, me talking to young students about <laughs> answering questions. Political as well as cultural. Of course, right, right? So, um, but, you know, I understand, because I was probably that person when I worked at the Auschwitz Museum, was like, what are you doing, you know? I've seen many, many things that are so inappropriate, and, you know, I've stopped people. One of the things I had said I was going to mention that because of where my office was, my window looked out at the crematory one wall um, and the gas chamber wall, and I would see people sitting on the wall eating their lunch. I, and maybe they did not know. I don't know. But I would have to go and be like, OK, I'm going down. Go out and tell them, right? My, my boss was pretty good about, um, before the regulations, there were places where people would wait for others to get done with the tour. And they would go and lay in the sun or sit. You saw in the parking lot, right, how many people were just wandering around and sitting. But all of these places are really sacred. And she would, she would go up and be like, excuse me, you're laying on blood-soaked ground, right? And I was sort of like, I can't say that. I just keep, like, I don't know. I just, it was hard for me to do that. But for the museum workers, they're used to this. And they see, right, um, that people don't always treat this place so well. So, yeah. Just this, I was on a tour this summer, and there was somebody literally smoking on the crematoria wall. And he's like, now I have no problem being like, excuse me, don't do that. So don't, just don't, can't, yeah. Yes? Have these incidences that you're referring to, have they always happened, or have they increased over the years? 
I'm thinking of the rise in anti-Semitism worldwide. Um, Great question. I actually don't think it's about being anti-Semitic. I think it's about people not knowing or understanding where they are and what they, what, where, where exactly they are, right? The, I think the people eating lunch on the crematory wall, once I told them that's where they were, they were like, oh, I didn't realize, right? They were just stopping to have their lunch, um, you know. Um, I would say that they have been consistent, but I think more importantly, post-1990, we have a lot more incidents of these things because of mass tourism, and there's also just dark tourism. People going to these sites because this is where there was mass murder, right? And there is, you can Google this on the internet, there are groups that go to like Hiroshima, go to 9-11, go to Auschwitz, because that is where many people were murdered. And, yeah. There's a recent incident at a Holocaust Museum in Detroit that I saw recently where um, young kids were able to get close enough to a life-size model of a German soldier in full uniform, and they were standing taking pictures, and some of them were doing the Heil Hitler, and so as they're remodeling this museum, they're redesigning and thinking of those things. And I was just wondering if, and I know that it's completely uh, anecdotal, but um, if people, when they first opened Auschwitz and Dachau and all these places, if, if people were that insensitive, I don't know. I actually don't think so. That's why, for me, and I don't know, I haven't really done the the history pre right uh 90s but i would say 90 90s were the the with the mass tourism right with just having access to the site and people coming from all over the world right and youth groups and you know there's a lot more as you saw right the the biggest amount of people uh the most visitors to auschwitz before uh 2016 when it hit 2 million was in the 70s when the pope was there now, I'm going to guess, because it was like 1.5 million that year, I'm going to guess that they were there because the Pope was there, not to, you know, deface or to steal anything. So I would still say that there were, there were more pilgrims coming. And when I started there, that was the attitude of the administration, as I said, that, that these visitors were not going to do anything harmful. Where I was like, oh, no, 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 <laughs> we need to switch this. Like, this, this needs to change. Yeah, so, but I will say also with the the building of the U.S. Holocaust Museum, one of the things that they did, sorry, Ron, I know you're, but one of the things they did, if you go to the U.S. Holocaust Museum in D.C., there, I think there are a total of three swastikas on display because they, they, they were conscious of, they don't want to display this, right? So, and today now they wouldn't, they, would, they wouldn't have no problem, right? But when they opened in 93, they were very aware of, we don't want places where neo-Nazis could come, things like this. And the Auschwitz Museum has had groups of neo-Nazis come, and they immediately turn them away, of course. So there's no question, even in the, po even in the pre-security years. <laughs>